Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be talking about the end of the world and beyond in our continuing study of end times prophecy. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is speaking to his disciples the night in which he was going to be betrayed. And he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Actually, when it's when he says believe in God, uh, the Greek text, you could translate that either as uh, an imperative, which this is the way it's translated here, where you he's telling them to believe in God. Or, and some, some translations might actually read it this way, uh, you could take the same Greek phrase and say it uh, this way too. You believe in God as a indicative, you know, that this is what you're doing. Now he tells, tells him, believe also in me. Uh, in, in either case, he goes on, verse 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, and here's the promise, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, all Christians hear this, uh, and and I, I, think, I want to say nearly all Christians understand that Jesus came the first time and that he will come again. In the Apostles' Creed, and this was a statement of faith that gradually developed. Uh, our earliest copies go to the early 300s, um, a few, about um, uh, 50 or 60 years later, a final edition came out that had one or two small editions. I'm not sure if the, the editions were good or not, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Um, this is one of those additions, he descended into hell. Uh, the, the earliest version that we've found doesn't actually have that, but not going to get into that here. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. We continue, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And here comes uh, the first part that deals with with prophecy, with eschatology. From there, that is from heaven, he will come to judge the living and the dead. It goes on, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Remember, that's not the Roman Catholic Church. The, the word Catholic just meant the everybody church, the, the church of, of all of God's people. Um, and I do believe in that. Uh, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. And, and here again, two lines at the end, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Now, that was a basic statement of what all Christians, that's why it was called the Apostles' Creed, that's not to say that it was written by the Apostles, but it was meant to summarize the teachings of the Apostles, and it did that right well. Um, and, and notice part of that was that, that Jesus would come to judge the living and the dead, and there would be a resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Now, when we get to the early 300s, now we have um, published what is called the Nicene Creed. I'm not going to read the entire thing. This was a, a creed that the Christians came together. Uh, the issue they were facing at that time was, was to understand what do we mean when we say that Jesus is the Son, son of God? Does that mean that God created him, or does that mean that, uh, that he actually is God, very God of very God? That's actually the language they, they came away with at Nicaea. Nicaea was a, a place about, a small town about 50 miles to the east of Constantinople. Uh, but the, the relevant part that I want to look at here um, for us, because we're studying prophecy, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Here it is. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So those two statements, those, those statements in first the Apostles' Creed and now the Nicene Creed, were the statement of faith for the early church. It goes on to say, this is the, the end of the Nicene Creed, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Remember, Catholic was the, the everybody church, not just the church in Rome. We acknowledge one baptism for the given, forgiveness of sins, and here it is, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So both creeds state very clearly these aspects of future prophecy, which were held by all the church. Now, the common elements that we've seen, first of all, that Jesus 
will return. That was that was a common element. Every Christian believed that, uh, that he would return in glory uh, to judge the living and the dead. I'm just borrowing the language that we already read. Uh, they believed in the resurrection of the body uh, and in life everlasting, and that his kingdom would have no end. The life of the world to come. Remember, that was the, the way the Nicene Creed ended. So these are three basic, and I've, I've put subpoints in there, but three basic teachings that Jesus will return, uh, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, with, with those other elements being descriptive of what that would look like. Now, the question isn't what the early church believed. The bigger question was, how do we put those together? It was, it's like having pieces of a puzzle, and everybody agrees what the pieces entail, but not everybody agrees in how they connect to one another. So we have these various prophecies uh, of the Bible, of the Old and New Testament, but putting them together, that's another matter entirely. Uh, now, you will remember that when Jesus came the first time with his first coming, there were prophecies in the Old Testament, in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures. And as a result of those prophecies, they again, they had the bits and pieces, they had the puzzle pieces, but putting it together was something that had resulted in a few different opinions of what the Messiah, uh, how he would look, what he would do, how he would be recognized, and so on. They had all the pieces, but how that all fit together, there was not a common agreement. And indeed, when he came, nobody had all the pieces correctly put together. (laughs) This group had it one way, another group had it another way, and when Jesus came, he did not meet any full expectations. He, He met bits and pieces, but not the way they had envisioned. And so, as we try our best to put the puzzle together, uh, remember how the Jews in the first century, um, when I say the Jews, I'm not picking on them, I'm just saying they were the ones that were reading the scriptures, the the Gentiles really weren't doing that. Um, Let's take some advice from them, let's look, and, and not be too dogmatic in the way we try to put those puzzle pieces together. But having said that, we are going to look at some of the different ways that Christians have dealt with that question. Now, notice the, the elements. That what I want to do right now is to look at the puzzle pieces, and then we're going to look uh, in a future class of how we put the pieces together. So that Jesus will return. Here is Titus chapter 2. Verses 11 through 13, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. We can actually render that a few different ways from the Greek text. It's it's not different Greek text. It's it's just how we understand that. Uh, Verse 12, notice it has appeared, uh, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, but also to live righteously, sensibly, uh, sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Here it is, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. By the way, that also tells you who Christ Jesus is. Uh, But that's not what we're looking at right now. What we're looking at is they're looking for the blessed hope and appearing of of his glory, that Jesus will return in glory. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, again, this idea that Jesus will return. When he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. So he appears, notice it involves not just an appearance, but he's coming back uh, at his coming. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, and inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, and here it is, Uh, Christ will appear a second time. This is why we call it his second coming. We don't call it his third coming (laughs) or fourth. Uh, He came once. That was when he was born of the virgin, born, suffered, lived, lived, suffered, and died. He will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, because he already put that away on the cross, to those who eagerly await him. Now, Christ will appear. Then, next element, there will be a judgment. 
Here's Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Uh, this is Paul speaking uh, at the Areopagus in Athens, and he's, he's actually explaining to this to, to Gentiles. Uh, so he's putting it in sort of basic Gentile terms where they can understand it. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, because <laughs> they'd all been ignorant for a very, very long time when it came to God, God is now declaring to men that all, notice the translators have inserted the word people, and that's okay. That's the idea. Uh, He's declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because, and here it is, he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. And then he goes on having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So the point is, um, there's, there's a day, a day that's been fixed, Now, we don't know when that day is. Jesus said he didn't even know when that day is. But God has fixed it uh, in which he will judge the world in righteousness through Jesus, through a man whom he has appointed. Acts chapter 10 and verse 42. uh, This is, again, uh, this is Peter this time speaking. Uh, He ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Uh, there, it, there will be a judgment. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, where Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, and notice he mentions Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing. And so uh, those things all will take place. Uh, and he goes on in and, and his kingdom, and, and he goes on to the next verse uh, with his charge. And finally, we noted there will be a resurrection. John chapter 5, verse 28. These are the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice and shall come forth, those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So there's coming a day, a resurrection, both to life, but also to judgment. You know, notice to life, those who uh, who did good, uh, those who did evil, and the word deeds is, is um, um, added by the translators um, for good or bad. I'm not, not so sure if that's a, a great thing to add. But for good or for bad, there's a resurrection of life and of judgment. Now, that means, and these are some of the different views that we will be looking at in, uh, in future classes, um, and so I'm not going to explain them right now, uh, what we know as historical premillennialism, uh, dispensationalism, which is also a form of premillennialism, postmillennial, uh, amillennial, and we'll explain all those terms, uh, but these are different prophetic views, and notice those three points that Jesus will return, there will be a judgment, there will be a resurrection. All of those different views believe those four, those three basic principles. But how they are put together, how they will take place, <laughs> there's a bit of disagreement, there's a bit of different ideas in these four views. Now, having said this, and I want to leave us on this note, you have all those four views that agree on those three points, but there is another view, and I'm going to look at that next, known as preterism, that denies those three aspects, denies that Jesus will return, that denies that there will be a judgment, that denies there will be a resurrection, and we'll look at that next time.